Atlantic engineers based out of Malaysia. Uh, and he would be taking this session. This session is organized by the Ishray Delhi chapter, Ashray India chapter, Ashray Rajasthan chapter, and Ashray Mumbai chapter. And uh, before we start, I'll just like to go through the Ashray code of ethics that we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which ex exemplify our core values of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, voluntarism, and diversity. ASHRAE is a 125-year-old organization, and all of you are aware of the work that ASHRAE does. So if you are still not a mem member of ASHRAE, please go to ashrae.org forward slash join and become a member there. Mr. T. L. Che, uh, as I said, is the CEO of Prime Tech Engineers, which is an engineering consultancy practice in Malaysia. He has a illustrious portfolio of projects uh, in the building services sector, which includes the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, the Kuala Lumpur Central Train Station, Convention and Exhibition Centers, Exchange 106, which is the tallest building in Malaysia, and has multiple award-winning energy efficient and clean buildings as part of his portfolio of services. He has authored multiple articles uh, and now and serves as an expert consultant to the to develop the National Energy Efficiency Master Plan for Malaysia, the Mega Science Framework Study for the Energy Sector, and multiple plans related to CFC and HCFCs, PIPV, and energy. He has also led the development of Malaysia's Green Building Rating System, which is called the Green Building Index, and uh, is renowned for his innovative and daring design work, which culminated in his award-winning designs for the new Securities Commission Headquarter Building, which is called the Diamond Building in Malaysia. He has been uh, active in various forums, and uh, these are some of his contributions to the industry over the years. And in 2010, he won the he got the gold medal award uh, as part of the ACDM. Now coming to the topic of uh, today's webinar, chill slab cooling, embedded chill water pipes for slab cooling in a hot and humid climate application is challenging in terms of avoiding condensation, thermal breach, as well as addressing the need for latent loads and indoor comfort conditions. The Energy Commission headquarters in Malaysia has successfully implemented this cooling strategy and has won multiple awards, including a platinum rating and ASHRAE Technology Award as well. Cooling by means of pumping liquid rather than moving cool air is many more times efficient, and the successful application of this strategy is now expected to see a growth of such interest in conjunction with green buildings. Before we begin, uh, ASHRAE Global Training Center has online training web series on this and many other topics. So please feel free to visit the training center and uh, choose your subject. Right, so I will now hand over uh, the panel to Mr. T.L. Chen to start this. Any of you have any questions, please write them in the, in the Q&A tab and we'll take the questions one by one at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Mr. Chen, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon and also good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll go straight to the presentation you just introduce the synopsis of my presentation but I'd just like to highlight that when we talk about application for slab cooling in the equatorial hot and humid climate application that is a very huge challenge and I will elaborate on it because of the high humidity here and the last bullet of the synopsis talks about cooling by means of pumping liquid and so on um, however, I must caution that there are always limitations. There's always pros and cons when it comes to embedded slab cooling. And I will also elaborate at the end of the presentation. Now, let's start off with chill beams and chill slabs. What is the difference or what are the differences? When you talk about chill beams, you have two versions of it, a passive 
or the active chill beams. Now, what are these? Basically, they're actually bare cooling coils. That's it, chill water cooling coils. And they can only provide sensible cooling, not latent cooling. So it's very important. And whatever you do, you got to make sure that because they're bare, there's, you do not go below the dew point while doing the heat removal. When they are combined with outside air, pre cool outside air to meet the ventilation requirements, then they become active chill beams. So here you are, the tabulation of that passive, you can have recessed, flush, exposed, or even like the active integrated with other services like electrical, lighting, or even return air path, and so on. Now, passive beams, as the name suggests, there's no moving parts or nothing. It's just a bare coil installed just below the slab. And how it works is by convection, where the hot air rises, gets drawn into the cold surface of the coil. And when it's cool, the, cold, the cooler air being more dense will then descend to the occupied space. And then you have that convection cycle. And you can see that it's a very narrow band when it's a passive beam. And here's a elaboration again. They are all very well established products around the world. Active beams, they are, they are now combined with conditioned outside delivery, air delivery, and you can have a primary air supply, whether from a dedicated out, outside air system or a primary air handling unit or fan coil unit. You can discharge your air vertically. Again, you induce the, the, hot, the hot air up to the surfaces and create a, con, a convection cycle or you can discharge the air horizontally and the same convection cycle results. Except that in this case, because of an active beam, the coverage is much wide, wider and not a, narrow, not, not a narrow convection cycle. The flush type and so on are all available. So now that you understand what are active beams, let's talk about chill slab, also known as embedded chill water pipes. Basically, you can see on the top left-hand corner, you can see the pipes being laid on the concrete, on the con uh, a formed concrete solid slab, and then cement will be added on top. Or you can actually install the pipes on the right, the picture on the right. The pipes are installed in between the starter bars before you cast the slab. And the end result is what you see at the bottom picture with the pipes somewhere in the middle of the slab. Now we talk about slab cooling, what better way than to explain to you in a case study, the Energy, Energy Commission headquarters building, which was completed 10 years ago. It's only the second building in Malaysia to adopt slab cooling, except that the challenge this time around, that is no more a demonstration building and it must work when it's handed over, no more extended TNC testing and commissioning period. And added to the challenge, was the client's desire for the building to achieve the highest accolade in green building rating. And I'll play you a three minute video. Try to, cons try to look at it carefully and then I will elaborate all the features that will be shown in this video. It's a three minutes video, so relax and enjoy yourself.
Okay, now that you've seen the video, let me just elaborate all the features that you saw and said there. First of all, let's start with the client's requirement. Like anything else before we design the building, we need to know in, in ASHRAE's terms, what is the owner's design requirement, project requirement, call it. First of all, the owner desires that the facilities is consistent with the Energy Commission's role as the authority and regulator of the energy sector. So they need to walk the talk. And what better way than to showcase an energy efficient and sustainable building? There was target set to achieve an energy, we call it a building energy intensity of not more than 85 kilowatt hour per meter squared per year consumption. At the time when we designed this building in Malaysia, the normal office building all clocked about 250 BEI, that's the kilowatt hour per meter squared per year. So this is about a third of that normal intensity. And we had to do that by employing state-of-the-art building technologies. The owner looked forward to it. And like any, any other owners you meet, they want a landmark building. And this building has actually achieved the iconic status. It is a, it's a, it's a big green building that I call it with all the bells and whistles of a green building that every green practitioner who visits Malaysia will make a beeline to look at this building. So we did, we did, the designers did achieve what the owner wanted. And to start off, the design, the first of all, is always the passive approach. Why the diamond shape? The diamond forms form with the tilting facade of which direct sun rays into the building. Now, if you understand Malaysia is located three degrees north of the equator and the sun shines overhead all year round. And because you're three degrees north of the equator, the S, the, we call it the azimuth angle of the sun, it's about 10 degrees. So that's how the tilting is done so they don't get any direct hit. The tilting facade also results in, in the smaller building footprint and allows far more area for landscape around the base of the building, the surroundings. And the surrounding landscape definitely reduces heat gain in the building. We call it addressing the microclimate. Let's look at the design plan itself. You can see starting from the left top hand corner, the landscaping, the arcade is so airy and well lit with natural lighting. The large landscape around the building, even the sunken garden, they all reduce the heat island effect. On the right hand side, again, again different views of the sunken garden. And right at the bottom, you can see even the main ramp at the basement, there's a basement car park. Is naturally lit and enjoys natural ventilation. The same goes for the sunken garden at the basement portion. Next, we go on to the typical floor plans. Each floor, we, we utilize harvesting of a lot of natural lighting from both ends, from the interior of the atrium and from the envelope of the building. And at the bottom left hand corner, you can see a view of the typical office room with glass partition. Just all internal partitions were stipulated to be glass partitions so they do, they do not block the daylight, allowing the daylight to penetrate through deep to all areas of the office floor. And on the top right hand corner, you can see the lounge below the light trough. In the video, you saw the light trough, a right angle right trough that reflects the natural light into the building. So this lounge area do not have any artificial daylighting and it's very well lit. And you can see other areas also being served by natural lighting wherever possible. Next, next let's look at the overall design strategy. And we look at energy itself, energy efficiency, because that's the best return for any building. And to try to be energy efficient, we first learn to design to reduce the demand. That's through the passive, passive design so that you do not, you shade the building well, you lower the envelope, so like you gain and so on. And when you need to use energy, look up and procure energy efficient appliances and equipment. And lastly, generate electricity yourself with PVs. Now the sixth, columns that you saw, you see there are the typical six major criteria of any green rating tool throughout the world. 
that be it be lead, even lead India, Griha, Green, Green Star, you name it, everyone including Green Building that's now. There's six main criteria. Let's start with the first left hand corner, the first column, energy efficiency. Uh, here I like to state that if you design for an energy efficient building, your building will not necessarily be a green building. On the other hand, if you design for a green building, more often than not, it will also be an energy efficient building. So what are the energy efficient strategies that we adopted? Some are very well tried out and understood, like light zoning, zone the lights, especially when you're harvesting daylighting, make sure the perimeter zones all can be switched off. Advanced EE performance in terms of the design, in this case, slab cooling and other, other sorts of state-of-the-art technologies like they employ. And while designing it, make sure the building is always sustainable in maintenance. So active measures are mentioned about even all the light fitting selection, renewable energy. The next column on indoor environment quality, that separates the difference between energy efficient building and a green building. Okay, green building in IEQ is so important. Right, that's where your productivity is. That's where your occupants need to be productive by feeling comfortable and conducive environment. So strategies are the use of low volatile organic compound emitting materials, non-toxic materials, odor free, ensure thermal comfort. And when you have daylight harvesting, you, you make sure that you have glare control. Sustainable site maintenance and management is a third column. The strategies are all to do with re reducing the heat island effect, reduce use of virgin resources, extensive use of recycled content materials, reduce waste during construction and also occupancy. Then the fourth column, materials and resources. Yes, learn to recycle, use recycled content material, regional materials, and even things like drip irrigation instead of sprinkler irrigation, which actually has a better efficiency in terms of irrigation. Water efficiency, the fifth column, how to ensure that. And in an equatorial climate, hot and humid climate, you do not call your, you do not deserve your building to be called a green rated building if you do not even harvest the rainwater. It's so plentiful of rainwater that the equatorial climate, we, we used, they used to say that we have two season climate here. That's hot and wet. However, in Malaysia, I like to say we actually have sometimes five seasons. We call it hot, wet, flood season. And the fourth season, the hay season, which you get out regularly whenever our neighboring countries start burning off their, their crops. And the last and favorite fifth season is our durian season, if you don't know what durians are. Now, apart from rainwater harvesting, which inevitably certain days, maybe for a week, sometimes you don't have rainwater, but how to ensure that you still have all this so-called recycle of free water. That's where water recycling comes in. And for this project, we do gray water recycling, not black water recycling. That's a bit too more, far more expensive. And we, had, we procure energy efficient water fittings throughout. And last but not least, also ensure that you have proper leak detection system because it's too late when you receive the water bill at the end of the month to realize that you have a leak. You have to detect that within the day itself. The last column and innovation is about whatever strategies you adopt. Some are already tried and tested. Some are the starting point where you're still rewarded. Others have moved on. Now in this case, we have heat pipe technology, which is the nearest perpetual cycle system we can ever have for humidity control. Then because of the slab cooling, you also enjoy thermal mesh storage, which we we'll elaborate later on. And here we also adopt advanced air filtration in the form of ESP, electrostatic precipitation filter, which is very good whenever you have a haze. And I suppose you have also a good feeling because of the virus, the COVID virus. And composting, yes, you have to compost and generate your own fertilizers and so on, especially when there's so much vegetation around. What's the end result? The summary of energy savings, Back in 2007 or 2008, when this project started out, LED lighting were not as established as today. Okay, so 
in, in, in those early days, we talked about TF lamps, T5 lamps, sorry, T5 lamps and compact CFL lamps to, re to replace the prevalent T8 lamps then. So even with that, we're talking about 40, over 40% 40 of energy improvement for the light fittings alone. And you augment that with a daylight savings, daylighting, which saves another 21%, reduced energy by another 21% on the lighting itself. And for the HVAC side, the aircon system, adopting slab cooling, you can reduce the energy use by 47%. And when you talk about slab cooling and so on, you're going to reduce tremendously the fan power, the, the fan energy. And in this case, up to 91% of the fan energy. The breakdown of energy consumption for this particular building, the cooling up to 50% is on cooling, lighting 19%. Small power 16%, other 16%. And we look at the food note. This building does not have its own chiller plant, but uh, taps it from the district cooling plant. And the district cooling plant has been converted into electricity for this energy calculation with a system COP of 3.8. If you have your own chillers, yes, it could be even more efficient. We have known results are over 4, 4.2, 4.3 is quite a norm. But uh, internationally, we adopt 3.8. What about the green features of this building? Very quickly, daylighting. This all contributed to the energy efficiency of the building. Daylighting, extensive savings on artificial lighting. You can see it's harvested through the atrium and the video shows a shading device to prevent glare. It's like an iris of an eye to maximize the daylighting. And don't forget that whenever we save on lighting, every one watt of, of lighting energy you reduce, you actually reduce up to 1.3 watts of energy because you save on about 0.3 watts on cooling. Apart from the lighting, daylight that we, we harvest from the atrium's core, we also harvest from the envelope of the building. And for that, the inclined facade helps a lot to reduce glare and we have a mirror light shelf or fix and fixed blind for glare control. Now you know you understand that whenever we need glare control with blinds, if it's not fixed, you need to open and shut every day. Chances are the occupants will leave it at one particular position. So with this fix, there's nothing to adjust. And the daylight is reflected onto the ceiling and bounced right deep into the, the office floor. It's in, on each office floor. Slab cooling, that's a subject matter of this particular presentation. And embedded slab. The slide shows 40%, it's actually more than 40% of cooling energy can be delivered by slab cooling. It increases thermal comfort and energy efficiency and reduces peak load. How do we do all these things? Now, I'll start with the bottom. It reduces peak load. Because of slab cooling, the thermal mass of the concrete stores energy. You can, pre -charge, you can continue to charge it overnight, and the next morning, when the sun, the so solar heat gain comes through, yeah, you do not need to pull down the load. So the peak load of the building is drastically reduced. And this is very important for the national agenda where you don't need to do a, a more, build more power plants to cater just for the peak load. And for other issues, there are always pros and cons I mentioned about. You do slab cooling, you notice the effect comes from the slab of the the ceiling slab where the cold air descends. From the floor slab where you're standing on, you know, you are covered with carpets and so on. There's very little cooling effect that you feel. So the lot comes, the, the bulk of it comes from the ceiling slab. And because of that, your limitation is you can't block the ceiling with a, with a solid floor, a false ceiling. And being unable to do that means you compromise on acoustics. So you can't have acoustic ceiling board. And that's where you got to be careful on that. And because it's embedded, when you do partitions and so on, you got to be careful not to puncture the pipes. So another limitation, which from my personal point, a point of view, is that we do not try to introduce this for speculative office buildings. Do it for owner-occupied buildings. Then can control all these issues. And how do you go about the, the design on it, that you charge slab 
you charge the the chill slab to 20 degrees centigrade in our in the microtera climate in Kuala Lumpur, 20 degrees. The lowest you can charge safely, maybe down to 18 degrees. If you go any lower, you risk condensation because our dew point is pretty high here. Our RH, our humidity is very high. So the 20 degrees has also an advantage because you do a secondary chill water circuit of 20 degrees centigrade, the chiller can be very efficient. So it depends how we do that. So these are the figures we have shown you uh, for, for design. And a typical cool day cooling load profile of the office floor there, you can see during office hours, it starts peaking. It's quite cons consistent for a office application. And you have to do the, the floor slab cooling can cater for 40 watt, 45 watts of per meter squared of cooling energy, whereas another 15 watts you had to do air cooling. And you need the air cooling to complement this because you have to extract the latent load. The only way to extract the latent load is by cooling the air, the air until it condenses and extract it out. The slab cooling can only cater for sensible heat. And I keep reminding that because that's crucial for the equatorial climate application. Fail, the, any failures are due to not addressing these issues. Now, why embedded chill water pipes again? How is it more efficient than a conventional air conditioning duct system? Uh, the next slide will, will answer everything. See, when we convey cooling by means of air, the amount of energy used, the fan power used, we have to compress the air. The air moves by compressing the air to push it forward. And so, Hence, the power energy use is if, is if you should see this slide, it tells you that to convey the same amount of cooling by air, you need an 18 inch by 18 inch air duct. Where else the same cooling can be achieved with a one inch diameter water, chill water pipe because water is not compressible. So, the whole theory is one unit volume of water can carry about 3,500 times more energy compared to the same volume of air. So that's your answer to the slab cooling. Renewable energy, solar PV. For this project, 71.4 kilowatt peak of solar panels were installed with a yield of over 1,400 kilowatt hour per kilowatt peak. This is about the highest yield thing you can get. Today, solar TVs in the Malaysian climate, you can have, at least you should harvest above a yield of 1,200 kilowatt hour per kilowatt peak. Nothing less than that, otherwise you're not efficient. And the amount that we installed for this project managed to contribute to 10%, almost 10% of the total energy consumption. Now, energy efficient IT purchasing policy. This is also very important for modern day office buildings. Gone are the days when we use CRT monitor desktops. Such desktop, if you can recall, can consume easily 150 watts to 200 watts per monitor per system. Compared to a laptop that consumes only 20 watts, you can see tenfold difference. And modern days, Today, we are also using tablets, which again, half the consumption to 10 watts per tablet. So it's important that we pay attention to purchasing all this equipment. Water efficient fittings. What do we do here? We use dual flush toilets, waterless urinals, not waterless urinals, because we're going to cater for the Muslim uses, and taps with aerators. All these are now normal in the industry. Nowadays, no suppliers do not provide water efficient fittings. By using this compared to conventional fittings, you can reduce up to 67 product, a reduction in the water usage. And you add on to rainwater harvesting. Again, the video you've seen, the two water harvesting tanks. Plentiful water harvested and we, we can reduce the the water by 35% for irrigation and also for toilet flushing and grey water recycling. To do that, you had to 
identify the correct plant to do to use. So we have a mini wetland, and until today, it is the greenery is still very lush in this building. So we selected the correct greenery that can can actually filter the odor and so on, absorb the odor of the grey water. Environmental friendly products throughout the building. Interior is important for good IAQ, indoor air quality and indoor environmental quality. So we use recycled plaster, low VOC paint, recycled content carpet, all this do not have do not emit toxic compound uh, gases. Greenery throughout the, this building, either at ground level or on the rooftop. Every inch greenery is provided. And if you look at the, the right bottom corner, you can see a measurement being done on the rooftop where the concrete portion of the rooftop, the temperature difference and versus the grass rooftop is about 4.5 degrees centigrade. So you can see the amount of heat reduction gain through the roof. And in equatorial climate, it is important, especially the low-rise building where we have more ratio of roof to the envelope of the building, because the roof is heated up all day long. The end result, integrating benefit from a commission, appointment of a commission specialist to ensure that the maximum potential of all the installed energy efficiency strategies are achieved. Now, commission specialist is a term that we use in Malaysia. In US, they use the term commissioning authority. In UK and uh, Australia, they use commissioning agent. They all mean the same thing. And yes, we have done training courses on commission specialists to get the X right. So we have developed a pool of commission specialists in the country. And this project won multiple awards. Martin Energy Award, Emerson Cup Award, and my favorite, the Ashray Technology Award 2013, second place. We didn't win the first place, but at least it's the first time a building outside North America has won this, has been disclosed. And I was told that we lost to the bill and Melinda, because here in equatorial climate, we can only innovate on cooling. We have no chance to innovate on space heating. That's where we lost out on in the awards. Okay, having given you the whole run through of this, the design of this building, let's talk about where are we? Lessons learned, I'd rather call it experience gain. But before I talk about what we can do better, because there's no such thing as that uh, any designer would say that we have a perfect building. No, we keep improving. We always want, want to be better. There's bound to be certain, certain corners we are overlooked. But let's start with overcoming skepticism in the first place to convince an owner. And I call it, I, I state here, convincing clients to adopt new concepts and emerging technologies in a developing country is often more challenging than the design itself. Which is very true everywhere else. Because stories of failures or unsatisfactory performance, especially within the region, has not helped. Although such failures are often traced to such technologies not being tropicalized to suit the local climate and environment. Unfortunately, the demonstration building, the first one to use that cooling in Malaysia, did, did suffer from that. Okay, now prior to the diamond building's construction, a government demonstration building adopted slab cooling, which required various modifications for over two years before we could finally achieve acceptable capacity comfort. What happened to that building was, when the day was open, everywhere around the office, the occupants, install floor standing fans because there's not enough ventilation rate going on. And that's the problem when designers do not understand the local requirement because for hot and humid climate, our air movement is more important and it far exceeds what ASHRAE asks for. ASHRAE says for comfort air conditioning, air the air velocity should not exceed 0.25 meters per second. For the, in Malaysia, our standards has been revised to say shall not will be recommended not to exceed 0.5, double that. Because we are hot and humid here, we need air movement over our skin. 
to create evaporation feeling. Otherwise, we will. It won't work in this part of the world. So, with the skepticism, fortunately, two favorable factors convinced the client to pursue the strategies for this project because the developer, who was also the contractor, was a leading proponent of sustainable construction and was, in fact, involved in the first slab cooling project that need, needed so much ratification. Now, in addition, the MEP engineer has successfully implemented emerging technologies in Malaysia's security mission headquarters, which is the award-winning energy efficient project built more than a decade ago. In fact, that was built in 1999. And this, is, this project actually featured underfloor comfort air conditioning and what today we call TTV, thermal displacement ventilation. I presented this, this uh, design many, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago in Delhi. Now, having said that, I will come the client's skepticism and so on. And having completed this project, let's see what else we can improve. And, I, and here are some of the issues identified. Minor condensation was spotted at the chill water pipe manifold riser cupboards. Because if you saw from the, the video, we had a very congested piping manifold. Therefore, proper pipe insulation was difficult. And when the pipes come down together with such close spacing to start distributing to the floor, it's also very congested bottleneck. So we have cold, cold spots over there. The charge tends to be colder than the other areas. So our suggestion is that future design should consider smaller zones served by each riser. Since more risers would allow adequate spacing for proper insulation and also mitigate the congestion of the bottleneck congestion. The slab charging strategy involves presetting a fixed charging duration based on best estimated calculations. So to achieve uniformity of slab temperature during chill water charging and eliminate risk of overcharging, temperature sensors to control the duration ought to be installed. Yes, we didn't install this. I suppose cost, cost savings as well. So we did try and error to do it, but future we're recommending just put these sensors. You'll be able to even have set points to allow for dynamic control of the charging process. So these are improvements that are recommended. Air movement, that's the part that I talked about early on, why the first project, the first demonstration project didn't achieve what it wanted when completed. Now, recognizing the air handler's size to remove only the latent load will provide insufficient air movement for a year-round hot and humid climate application. Higher air movement was originally, originally addressed by incorporating fan-assisted VAV units. See, for a hot and humid climate, because of the adopted slab cooling, the bulk of the cooling load is really catered for by the slab cooling, which addresses the load. For office building, the amount of latent load is not that high on the office occupants and also the outside air being taken in. So we only address that part of the latent load for minimum air cooling. Then we've been in trouble because we do not have enough air movement. So for originally in this design, we, in, we incorporated fan-assisted VAV system. What do you mean by that? I don't know whether how many of you have implemented that. It would, it would have been the first in Malaysia where, yes, we still use VAV system to reduce, to reduce the air required for cooling, but whatever minimum air that we set can then, through a fan, uh, a fan that recirculates the air to create the necessary air change. However, due to the extremely high escalated metal cost, when the project was standard out in 2008 and 2009, which was the height of the world metal price crisis. I'm not sure whether how many of you went through this period. The, my, the developer, who is also my, the designer's employer, sought to find an alternative. And we, we decided to replace this with normal VAV units to cut down the cost. 
and instead the, re the redesigned enlarged used enlarged ring ducts to maintain a minimum of four air change per hour for that ventilation mode. Unfortunately, due to space constraints, when we, when we had to redesign, the compromised ring ducts did not achieve the desired minimum airflow and resulting in a few stagnant areas. Fortunately, those are very minor areas, so uh, it's only the designer that's aware of this 100% uh, target. We didn't achieve the 100%, but it was good enough because there's actually no, no complaints around. Another area because of this project that uh, created awareness was the issue of district cooling commercial rates, uh, charge rates. The diamond building has prompted district cooling plant operator to consider storing the cooling thermal energy generated during off-peak period in buildings rather than investing in costly thermal storage plants. Now here in Malaysia, we have peak and off-peak load. So the, the charges for maximum demand at peak and off -peak, the difference between peak off-peak load is very hefty. And that's the reason why thermal storage is feasible because you shift the off-peak load to a lower tariff. But here we are saying that owners of projects that incorporate sharing thermal mass with chill water that are served by district cooling systems should negotiate for after office chill water costs because we're charging after office hours. So we ought to also be charged a lower rate. And this project created awareness and yes, we negotiated for that. Negotiations for lower rates can be based on cost-effective higher charging temperature also. There's a higher charging temperature. We do not need a low charging temperature. Remember, 20 degrees centigrade for the diamond building and the capital cost savings of the district cooling system operator who can use the spilling slab for thermal mass storage rather than construct additional thermal storage plants. So there's an option to store energy within the buildings that you're serving rather than a thermal storage plant. In terms of integrated design, what we learned from here or the experience gain is that early integrated design is key to achieving successful, sustainable building design and operation. The planning process begins with, began with trips to visit other green projects and we chose Singapore and Thailand which are closer to our, our top climate and design workshops to bring storming sessions which included all the key consultants. That's when you want to design a sustainable or green building, you have to involve a holistic approach right at the beginning. So any crazy idea to advance the goals of energy efficiency and sustainable design will all welcome during these sessions. The energy efficiency consultant created building simulations quantifying performances, especially in terms of daylight harvesting and, and the envelope design were iteratively aided the design the building design development itself. So these are very important teamwork as well. And yes, that concludes my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. And actually the building was featured in the ASHRAE, uh, I say the magazine quite some years back. Thank you. Okay, I'm open to questions. Uh, question time now. Right, Mr. Chen. Uh, do you see the questions in the question and answer button? Uh, there are some questions there. Would you like me to read them out or would you? Okay, you can read it out. Right, so there is one question that uh, uh, would the challenges be similar to composite climate too? I think this is the question. What, sorry, charges. Would the challenges be similar for composite climate too? Um, okay, subtropical climates like uh, India, you, where, where the humidity is much lower and you have a seasonal climate, where you see India, in India you can even uh, uh, enjoy the uh, outside economic air cycle at periods of time. In Malaysia, no. So the challenges are more severe here. So applying this in a subtropical climate, I think it's much easier because then it's easier to control the thermal breach and other issues because your dew point would be much higher. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. The, the, I, sorry, other challenges are still there. 
that the owner occupied building because we got to make sure that the pipes are not punctured accidentally. And uh, maybe I elaborate. How many of you, I ask a question, how many of you have ever visited the, the uh, new Bangkok airport building, so-called new, it's the Suwana Bumi Airport in Bangkok. Do you realize that it's all chill slabs as well? But because of what happened there, what can go wrong actually all went wrong there. Because the pipes are all punctured because you couldn't control it because there's coordination between the ID and the engineer. The engineer designs everything in straight lines. The ID starts having curves all over. So we couldn't control where the partitions are that puncture the pipes. And the resultant, uh, the resultant issue there is in Bangkok Airport, now you go there, it's the best place to study all types of air conditioning system because they have to supplement it, complement it to make the whole building cool again. Okay, so that's it. So that's the challenge you have when you use that cooling. Okay, next question. Right, then uh, there's a just a question that is this would this presentation be available for the attendees? Uh, the uh, PDF file, uh, yes, the handouts. Uh, I think I'll give you permission to give to them if you wish to. All right. Uh, okay, so we'll share the handouts with the attendees. That's I'm all. Not sure which the next what the next question is, but it is written chilled floor versus chilled slab. I am not sure what the question is. Sorry, chill, chill slabs versus what? Chilled floor. I think it's one chilled of the same floor. thing. No, yeah. chill floor for chill slabs. And that's it says chill beams. Chill beams, as I showed you, the beams, they are detached, so it's not cast in the slab. Yes, it can be used as well. But don't forget, whether chill beams, chill beams most of the time, yes, in subtropical climate and so on, you have more application. In, in the equatorial climate, very limited because it basically because it can only handle slab cool, uh, well, sensible cooling. So in machine rooms, equipment rooms, you can do that. But again, watch out for condensation. So there's one more question: embedding chilled water pipes in the slab may affect the carpeting. How is this prevented? And what's the scenario around carpeting if using these? No, it's just okay. You can you can ca carpet it, but then the the chilling effect comes from the ceilings. This the slab on the uh, above you, the slab. So it, it's inevitable you want carpet in the office floor because of sound acoustics and so on. It's all right. They, so, but they, what if what if the what if the pipes, the chilled water pipes, are cast in the slab, which is the portion of the slab which is closer to the floor rather than the ceiling? If I want the floor cooling, is that an option? Um, if you don't have carpet, of course you're fast. You have double effect from both sides, but uh, the, but then from what well, one one slab is good enough. There's enough cooling effect to drop down, and the uh, pipes are anyway made of. By the way, the pipes are made of polycarbonate, and uh, in fact, uh, it's less. It's an inch. Of, that's what this project did. They shop it online, and um, the, the trick is also to make sure that you circuit it so right. that there's multiple circuit in case one is punctured. You can still isolate the circuit. Okay, I hope I answered all these things. Yes, and uh, there is one more question. What are the difficulties in construction and maintenance of cooled slabs, chilled beam slabs? Not much. Uh, not much. Uh, you can see that the reduction in uh, uh, air handling units and so on, the chill slab, the most important thing is discipline. You make sure that your s builds are very clear, your flaws are very clearly marked so that in, in case there's any reconfiguration of your partitions and so on, that you know exactly where to drill and not, not to punch it. That's the big challenge. And the other challenge is, of course, yes, uh, acoustics. Yeah, you have no more acoustic ceilings, so you can address acoustics in a different way. Your acoustics is not going to be uh, as perfect as if you can put the acoustic board. Right. Then, uh, what type of chiller application was adopted? Air cooled or water cooled? Primary circuits only or primary secondary? It, it, it doesn't matter what's, whether air cool or water cooled chiller. Of course, in equatorial climate, water cooled chillers are more efficient than air cooled. But then, it depends. Air cooled chillers are fine as well. Right? The only thing is that, yes, you have a advantage whether you like to have a secondary uh, with a heat exchanger to, really, to, to make use of chill slab where you only require uh, chill water of 20 degrees centigrade instead of your normal 6 or 7 degrees centigrade. So it's it's a lot of choices for you to decide how more efficient you can design. 
Thanks. The next one is what should be the design temperature in order to avoid condensation issues? Uh, I've already given to you in, uh, in equatorial climate like in Malaysia, yes, and the slab should not be cooled down anything below to be safe 18 degrees centigrade. Lower than that, there's still a tolerance maximum of the lowest, lowest you can ever go is 16. But that is, that is, that is already right at the dew point. So if there's some leakages or anything, or infiltration, you'll be condensating. So my recommendation is push it to 18 to 20. To 20. That's the range. Right. So there's one uh, clarification on the earlier question. So uh, there is a user by the name Technova HYD, and they're asking that in case of a chilled floor, the embedding is above the slab instead of inside the slab. And if you put, okay, if you put above the slab, remember I showed you the floor is already cast, you put the pipes on top of the slab, then you screed across it, on, on top of it, then your, your screening is very thick. Yes, then you take a, long, a longer charging for the, the whole slab below to get, to get even charge. So the charging time is much longer. And especially right. with cement on it, and then you put a carpet on it, it's wasted the, because you're not getting the, uh, the effect through, to, from the slab, rather you're from the ceiling. So you've got to wait until the, the, the whole slab, thickness of slab is charged before, before you get the effect. Right, so there are two co similar questions. I'll take them in a combined way. One is, what are the energy savings with respect to the air-based cooling system? And then what is the payback compared with the conventional system? Okay, uh, when you talk about it, I already showed you the, the advantage of cooling using steel slab versus air. Straight away, I showed you, yes, you can save so much on fan energy, tremendous amount of fan energy. If you ask for the pay payback, Probably within three, five years, you should be able to get your payback or your shorter, depending, depending on your application. So yes, the payback can be very high, but don't forget, don't jump into it, I keep saying, because there are limitations to it. There are uh, so-called uh, pros and cons on it. Right? Remember, because the acoustic issue, your, your, uh, one is acoustic issue, one is your limitation on controlling partitions and so on. So there's always that setback. Yes, energy-wise, you gain a lot, but if it's owner-occupied, no problem. Otherwise, you see what happened to Bangkok Airport? Yes, it's supposed to be owner-occupied, but not necessary because all the retail outlets are not controlled. So it becomes speculative and it got punctured everywhere. Thank you. Uh, did you use CFD simulation to analyze the air movement? And did you use a combination of displacement type air terminal plus floor and slab coolant? Oh yes, we, we, we do a combination of all to, to be confident of it, yes. Right, so I'll just go through the questions in the chat. What is the cooling watt per meter square we can expect from the cooling slab? Uh, again, my slides have shown you uh, about 45 watts per meter square. Uh, again, I'm, I'm qualifying that this for our Malaysian climate. So in India, you've got to, you've got to so-called uh, check yourself and, and compute yourself again. So right. that's what Malaysian is. So are the embedded pipes coated or treated in and out to avoid corrosion and to provide yeah, insulation? You don't need to do any coating or anything because these are polycarbonate. They're, they, are not, they are not metallic pipes. There's no corrosion. Right, exactly. And what was the care taken to ensure the life of the embedded pipes? I think this is... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it's, it, is non uh, it's, it cannot be uh, corroded and so on. So it's, it's like plastic and polycarbonate. So yes. it's not punctured. It was, it's going to last a long time, especially if it's encased. It, it should last the, the life of the building, I suppose. <laughs> right. And what would be the hot water temperature if we use this for heating purposes? Sorry, I can't get a question. What would be the hot water temperature if we use this for heating purpose? Oh, if we use for heating, I think you don't need to look for me. You look for, th those are practice, practice uh, in Europe everywhere. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. Uh, the heating. I okay. think we'll need to get somebody from Finland for that. Okay. Uh, can we use this in hospitals where floor, higher flow rates are required? Uh, hospitals, again, I already said no, because hospital is, you would reconfigure it 
many times and uh, you have to be careful because hospital you need a lot of air, you need the ventilation for disease control and so on. Yes, the advantages may, may be limited compared to office application and so on. Right. Um, we just, uh, and uh, we just take one more question. That the building has a positive air pressure to keep the moisture out. Uh, you, 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 your voice broke out a bit. Can you repeat the question? Did the building have positive yes, pressure very important to keep the moisture out? When you design out? in a hot and humid climate, an air conditioned building must always be positive pressure. Yes, so your ventilation outside airway, make sure that it's positive. You make sure that your building facade envelope is reasonably airtight. All right, in Malaysia, I won't, I won't go for, uh, I won't go for uh, ideal that the, the facade or airtight in Malaysia is more important to be watertight because our rain is, is really heavy. But yes, we can make it airtight by having a positive pressure. Make sure the the amount of fresh air outside air you introduce it is always more than what you're exhausting up to. Keep it at least neutral or positive at all times. Yes, uh, there are two very important questions. One is, will the slab cooling affect structural reinforcement? And no, if you work up with the structural engineers, no, no issue at all. Okay. And how to pinpoint leakage if it happens later during operation stage? Nowadays, you have all these in infrared cameras and all these things, you can detect it very quickly now. All right. I think we have, uh, there's one more question. Uh, does the embedded polycarbonate pipe reduces the strength of the slab? Reduces the strength of the concrete. Slab, yes. Yes, talk to your structure engineers. We have no problem with that here. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, sure, I think we, not this. We've covered most of the questions. Um, I, can, I offer this. You can see my email. Those who have very pressing questions they forgot to ask, by all means, yes. email. Yes. So you can reach out to Mr. Chen at tlchen55 at the rate gmail.com. So uh, with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chen, for this uh, very informative uh, webinar. And it's a very niche topic, so it helped that you presented a case study uh, uh, as a successful example of him having implemented this. Okay, thank you. My pleasure as well, and thank you for the audience. Thank you, everyone. We are closing the webinar now.